Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. Today we're joined by our colleague Jason Kuznicki, a research fellow at Cato and editor of Cato Unbound. Today we want to talk about an essay by the philosopher Robert Nozick on what's a pretty interesting question uh, and one that a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to answer, including many of us here, which is, as the title of the essay, Why Do Intellectuals Oppose Capitalism? And I should note the essay is up on libertarianism.org and we will put a link to it in the show notes. So in this, in this short essay, Nozick gives what he thinks is the reason, which has to do with schooling. Um, and so to very briefly summarize, the idea is that intellectuals of the kind he's talking about – and we'll get to his definition of intellectual in a second – tend to do very well in school and they tend to receive a lot of praise in school and as a result, they think that the way school operates is the way that society ought to operate because each of us would like society to be structured in such a way that we come out on top and we receive the prestige that we think we deserve and that the way that schools are structured looks more like a command and control economy, more like socialism than it does like capitalism. Therefore, intellectuals oppose capitalism and support socialism. More or less, yeah. I think that the the first important uh, proviso I think we should have on this episode is that we are not doing or at least I am not doing. I don't know about you guys but we are not doing a pathologizing of our opponents because it's something I, <laughs> I always try and warn uh, people that there's a very big tendency in political discussions and political thought to pathologize your opponents, to explain the reasons they disagree with you as some sort of like mental illness. And the classic example of this is – uh, at least recent is Dinesh D'Souza's The Roots of Obama's Rage, which was trying to explain why President Obama has pretty milquetoast leftist policies via some sort of uh, father complex. And I had never read the book, but this is very dangerous. There's reasons people can disagree with you that are valid uh, that do not require them to have some sort of mental condition. Right, right. But, so, but it is important to try and explain. You know, when there's a disproportionate amount of people who hold one type of belief in one area, then it is something that is worth an explanation. Like we, it's not an equal distribution of pro-capitalists and the intellectuals we're talking about. So we're trying to talk about a phenomenon, not saying, well, here's how why stupid people, why these people are dumb, and why they have a mental block and disagreeing with us. Well, yeah, I mean, it is a phenomenon, and it's fair to observe it. It's something that people on the left have also observed. It's not something that we have. Have made up. Uh, it doesn't involve necessarily psychological factors. Um, one way that this has been discussed, in in particular by people on the left themselves, is that what's happening is uh, what might be called a long march through the institutions. That if you want to achieve social change in a, a leftist direction, the way to do that is to simply insert yourself into positions of power in important institutions in society and uh, take them over. And it doesn't have to be a, a bloody revolution. It doesn't have to be violent. It can simply be a gradual peaceful takeover. And people on the left have in fact said that this is what's happening. Now, Nozick doesn't seem to agree with that. He doesn't talk about it really. He has a different set of explanations for it. Trevor Well, I think that the, the – that, that's an important point too and it's also important that we don't necessarily have to criticize them for that because you could say that libertarians have had our own strategy for trying to get people into places of influence or in influencing people. Uh, Cato, we, we, we do it with voluntary contributions more often than government money. Right. But Every ideology it, spends time thinking about how can I convince other people that I'm right. Yeah. yeah once I mean, you take out the long march thing, I mean, it's really everybody's doing it. It's once just you, a strategy. You know, just yeah. avoid the you know, avoid the loaded term there, and yeah, we're all doing it. It's all it's all uh, that anybody does. And I feel like we all. Ought to acknowledge up front, there is also the the possibility that the reason that intellectuals oppose capitalism, that the reason intellectuals embrace socialism. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think this is true, but intellectuals are highly educated people. They they know a lot. Um, they they tend to be very smart, and maybe it simply is the fact that capitalism doesn't work, and that socialism does, and that the reason that they oppose capitalism and support socialism is because of that, that they're simply right and that the more you know and the smarter you are, the more likely you are to believe true things and therefore they, they're correct. Mm -hmm. I mean we, we should – that's, that's like the, the argument that 
they would of course give. They would and you love hear that, that all the time true, that yes. like the you know the democratic policy proposals, progressive policy proposals are supported by smart people because they're good proposals. Except in economics departments. In economics departments, people tend to be much much more supportive of the free market than say in sociology or uh, or literature departments. Well, the, the I think that the average uh, professional economist Pro professor of whatever sort is to the right of his colleagues in the humanities department, maybe substantially so when it comes to sociology or anthropology or things like this, and maybe slightly to the right of the average person, but, but or but maybe not. I'm not sure. I think that I've read this. The, no, I think that they're slightly to the left of the average, like median. But person. they're not market anarchists. They're, no, <laughs> no, no, no. But this is this is a good time to. Move into. I mean, Nozick has something very specific in mind when he says intellectuals, and so he would actually, I think, exclude the economics professors that we're talking about from what he refers to as wordsmith intellectuals. I'm not sure he would, but continue. I, I think that, it, that economists, as usual, are right on the edge of because he has this thing with wordsmiths, which is uh, he has uh, includes poets and journalists and playwrights. But and he, things like this. he singles out wordsmiths versus people who work with numbers. People who work, work with numbers are not a part of his uh, explanatory system. He thinks that he's identified something particular to people who work with words. But so are we economists can, more like physicists or are they more like We can discuss that and some, some – I mean it also will depend on the economist. But we can, we can bracket that issue for now and say that – so what he is talking about when he says intellectuals is something he calls wordsmith intellectuals. And Jason, can you tell us what he means specifically by a wordsmith intellectual? A wordsmith intellectual is someone who shapes the flow of words that other people will see. And that can be in any number of different disciplines. It could be a historian. It could be an anthropologist. It could be a uh, philosopher. It could be any number of different any number of different academic specialties, and also uh, professions outside the academy who are are in some way shaped by those disciplines. So people who are uh, TV news commentators, uh, people who are journalists, uh, you're going to see them. Uh, to some degree, share the same characteristics. Now, this is the interesting question here, which he doesn't really deal with. But Aaron and I have actually talked about this in the past too. The excluding the quote number smith people. Uh, why? I mean, it seems like that's an entire thing you could ask too. Not just why do intellectuals oppose capitalism, but why do only one sort of subset of intellectuals? Why does someone who spends their entire life studying the cell walls of green algae that exists in the Indian Ocean, not terribly prone to one type of ideological belief or another. That There seems to be something in that. Isn't uh, that partly explained though by his, his ultimate explanation of why intellectuals, wordsmith intellectuals oppose capitalism is the, the kind of students who do well in school. Um, but that would be but, true of the physicists. That's the one thing that really – so you know, we were kind of going through the essay and it's a very short essay. So uh, you can read it very quickly. But yeah, it's basically this – as was summarized, uh, the sort of not seeing their value in society and seeing – having experienced their value in schooling and, and thinking that they should be valuable like that. But that's true of physicists. Well, it is and it isn't. Uh, Nozick says that wordsmith intellectuals or incipient wordsmith intellectuals are praised by their teachers. The meritocracy happens on a face-to-face -face basis and uh, you are pulled into a network in which perhaps the people who are already there are to some degree socialist. Uh, they are already highly critical of capitalism. They praise you. They tell you that you deserve a great deal of prestige. They tell you that you deserve uh, honor and what, whatever is the best in society and, uh, and that validates a particular worldview. With, with the, the quantitative people, he doesn't really go into explaining how their professional lives work. But I would say that things probably work differently there because your reputation as a quantitative researcher depends on your experimental results. They depend on having results that are interesting, results that are uh, confirmed by other researchers, re results that can be objectively demonstrated. It's not about feeling. It's not about, it's not about uh, personality. It's about whether or not you can deliver results. And uh, results are a thing that uh, can be agreed upon in, in a more objective fashion. So Nozick notes in, in the beginning of the essay that there are – when you ask the question, why do intellectuals oppose capitalism? Um, there are 
two approaches to answering it and he's really only concerned with one and I think we should be clear about that up front. So the first one is the – could be rephrased as what reasons do intellectuals give for being opposed to capitalism? So this one would be answered along the lines of capitalism hurts the poor or leads to inequality or isn't as good and wonderful and utopian as – socialism. So if you were to ask an intellectual, what do you think is wrong with capitalism? These are the reasons they would give. That's not what Nozick is interested in here. Um, he is interested in the second way of looking at this question, which is how do intellectuals come to hold those views? And so it's – that's how this schooling enters in is because the – the forces at play that he thinks are pushing them towards socialism and away from capitalism are taking effect before we even get to them holding views about socialism and capitalism. This is stuff that's happening from when they're you know, elementary school kids on up, that there's, there's certain things they're exposed to that then when they eventually get to the question of what economic system is best, influence how they think about it. Um, and he's concerned about this question also that like because it's it's more than just an interesting like here's a group of people who seem to disproportionately lean a certain way why he's he's concerned he thinks this answering this has weight because intellectuals and especially wordsmith intellectuals are very influential in society that they shape the opinions of non-intellectuals of most other people in society in a way that other categories of people don't. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, this bringing up as a point of reference, as a footnote uh, to your point that that's also in Hayek's view, the intellectuals in society, which was his essay where he explained how he thinks you change the world. He was interested in influencing what he called secondhand dealers and ideas, which were uh, the intelligent people, including lawyers and journalists and things like this. Not necessarily the Nobel Prize winning professor, but the people who talk about the Nobel Prize winning professor's work, uh, who influence the people around them there in when they go to bars and when they have dinner parties. And he said we have to get those people to believe in capitalism before we can really change the world. And so it's, it, it's a, as a footnote, that's a similar type of thing. The people that he's focusing on, I think, in Nozick's essay is, is similar here. Right, right. Because uh, how many people actually sit down and read academic papers by Nobel Prize winners? Most people don't. They will read, though, popular accounts of those papers and that's where, that's where those secondhand dealers and ideas become very, very important. Now, uh, to get back to Nozick just a little bit, he says, uh, he says in this essay that the schools – are, quote, the major non-familial society that children learn to operate in, end quote. And that's, uh, that's, I think, very, very important because if you learn in school what society is like, then you will presumably think that school is what society should be like. When society turns out to be different from school, it will be evaluated as a failure. I want to I want to go more into that because – the most interesting thing that I find in this essay is the is the discussion of the value that the intellectual holds for himself. So you have this part in the value of intellectuals where he says, intellectuals now expect to be the most highly valued people in a society, those with the most prestige and power, those with the greatest rewards. Intellectuals feel entitled to this, but by and large, a capitalist society does not honor its intellectuals, which becomes a sort of weird type of projection in this to say, well, there's something wrong with a society that doesn't ad adequately value the things that are valuable. And I, this is the first point in the essay where I kind of wanted to push back at Nozick because I don't think our society fails to value intellectuals. I think they certainly get a very high level of prestige. Uh, maybe it's never enough. Uh, I know that Robin Hanson has said that uh, people are fundamentally motivated by prestige and that uh, more, than, more than money, more than almost anything, what people want is to be respected and loved by those around them, to be told that they're really important, to be told that society needs them. And we say this about we say this about our intellectuals. So, for example, uh, even in my relatively conservative family, if I were to say, "Hey, guess what? I got a tenure track position at Harvard," that would command respect. Now they might say, "Oh, well, Harvard," huh, huh. but but they would still think, "Wow, he's really accomplished something. That's prestigious. That's important." And uh, and you know maybe maybe uh, that's not enough, but it's something, and it's it's certainly something on par with uh, with almost any other significant form of prestige in our society. 
I can think of a couple of ways to maybe answer that from from Nozick's perspective. Um, the the first would be that on on the broad level, for every Cornell West or for every Paul Krugman, there are countless intellectuals, countless people who did very well in school and went on to become professors or worse, adjunct professors oh, yeah. who are, <laughs> you know, on, on a relative level, not getting much acknowledgement, and they're especially not getting. I mean, they may get like your family might think it's it's really neat that you went to that you get a tenure track position at Harvard, but the broader society is not paying attention to that kind of thing. They don't know who the Harvard faculty are, except for the handful of very very famous ones. So there isn't a lot of prestige outside of your small circle, and then along similar lines. The the kinds of people who have very broad level prestige, again, setting aside the handful, the very small handful of super famous academics are like the guys on Duck Dynasty um, <laughs> or you know, they're, they're sports stars or they're actors or they're the occasionally – Kim the Kardashians. Yeah, the, you know, people who inexplicably and there's – or they're, they're occasionally like famous businessmen or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates who – to the intellectual are decidedly not intellectuals and so perhaps not deserving of the kind of prestige. Well, I want to dovetail off that too because I think that Nozick's point is a little bit too inward facing to the intellectual himself about whether or not he's being valued enough. I think that matters. But I think that the other thing is it was more what Aaron's point, the question of whether or not an intellectual thinks regardless of their specific place is more of a general proposition. Is the world valuing the right things correctly? Uh, that question, which is less, in, is the world valuing me correctly? I, I think that a, a humble, realistic intellectual who is the world's foremost authority on Rousseau uh, at Harvard doesn't probably think that that should be the most important goal of society is to acknowledge that Rousseau experts are, are the preeminent top rung. But he thinks that in general that the kind of things that intellectuals like to do, uh, whether it's contemplative life and not watching Duck, Duck Dynasty and listening to the symphony. So why do symphonies have to be supported with public money but these stupid screaming bands are supported with the market system? So the general question is whether – and I think this is a very, very important question in free market thought which is the, the dichotomy between someone's perception of what's valuable and how they perceive the world as whether or not it is accurately valuing the valuable things. And in many ways, one of the reasons that Marxism is like a religion in many ways is because the – many religions say essentially the world is run by false values, like the, the basic core – bottom thing is that the world is run by false values. It should be piety and not money. It should be these and not that. Uh, Marxism says this too to some degree. A lot of political – you, you can always feel this idea in a lot of speeches that the, the point is that the world is being run by false values and we need to figure out some way to correct that. But to pull this back to – so when Nozick, he says you know, there's the two ways of answering the question. So what you're describing is that first way of answering the question. Like the intellectual can say, look, capitalism – means a world based on false values. I think these are the correct values, therefore not capitalism. But to pull it back to that second version of the question, which is how did the how did the intellectuals come about having these ideas and attitudes? That's where we get to the school because what he's saying is that because the intellectuals were in this non-familial community, that the, the, the community they spend so much of their time in, that all of us spend so much of our time in, which is the school system as we're in our formative years, that that is a society that rewards intellectual kind of things, that you get praise from your teacher when you write the really good paper or you ask the smart question or you can articulate the answers in, in a way beyond what your fellow students can do. And so – and if, if you're the kind of person who does well in that sort of stuff, you like it. Um, and we tend to think that a society that we like is the right kind of society. Um, the society that makes us happy is the right kind of society. And so you come to think – that the values that are important are the ones that happen to be praised, happen to be rewarded within the school system. And so then when you get out and you look at the society outside of it, that's when you start to say, well, that doesn't look like the school system, so there must be something wrong. 
Yes, and and one of the things that's I think key in understanding the market process and and you know so sort of sociology of the market is that if the market process is doing its job, if it's doing what it's supposed to do, a lot of its results are actually going to look random to any particular observer. They are going to look as if nothing of value has been provided. They're going to look as if uh, money has been distributed in an arbitrary fashion because what the market process does is to discover previously unknown knowledge. And when it does that, you didn't have that knowledge. By definition, you didn't have it. So your judgments about that are likely to be or have a good chance of being uh, false. You're going to think, aha, the market does things that are crazy and I have knowledge that enables me to, to make that judgment and I can judge it. Now, uh, what, what Hayek's insight into the market was is that, look, this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like when it's doing its job. And, and to some extent, those judgments are going to look arbitrary, the judgments that are, are, are bestowed by the market because what has happened is someone who happened perhaps – simply by randomness to have that piece of knowledge when other people did not was able to monetize it. So I, I wanted to uh, – I think that's a good point, an incredibly good point and we could bring in Schumpeter and all these other things too. But on Aaron's point about the, the my discussion of values was more about the first question, the second question. I think it sits on the edge because of what I had said. I think that we could say this is the maybe the reason, the substantive reason why they think capitalism is wrong. But I think it's also a, person, a personality. I'm, I'm not trying to pathologize here. I think it's uh, the question of false values is sort of a way that you can project uh, from your head out to the world about whether or not this is these are good things that are happening in the world and good things are produced by this. And the milieu that intellectuals are raised in uh, has them projecting out. So it's it's a combination of both the substantive critique of capitalism, its its false values, but also the projection internally from the intellectual of why they would be prone to believe that specifically. And and one isn't really necessarily committed to thinking that either value system is false. I found myself thinking and, and reading this of uh, Jane Jacobs' really, really excellent short book, uh, Systems of Survival. And she suggests that there are two different sort of moral paradigms. One of them is commercially oriented. It says things like, like be honest in trade, be open to new experiences, uh, welcome strangers and treat them fairly as you would treat your friends, uh, be, be uh, enterprising, be efficient. Uh, and, and she calls this the commercial, the commercial paradigm. Uh, then she also says there's another one, the guardian paradigm in which you are supposed to do things like respect honor and hierarchy and to know your place within a system and to, to value tradition and continuity. And uh, and I found myself thinking, well, of course, the market is is in the you know the commercial system, and the the academy is much more like the guardian system. And and Jacobs actually does not want to say that either of these are necessarily wrong or evil, uh, but they have they have particular roles to play in society. So commerce is great at providing stuff, uh, but it's actually not necessarily so great at. Uh, providing public goods or providing, uh, say, the defense of stuff. Uh, we have governments for a reason and governments operate on the guardian morality. Uh, to a great extent, I think the academy does also. I wonder if what's going on here somewhat when we talk about these, these conflicting views of how society ought to be organized, the conflicting value systems and then couple it with your good point about the randomness of the market um, because I'm struck by – I should preface this by saying one of the things that we remark on here at Cato a lot is that when it comes down to it, what's really frustrating is how few people are actually in favor of free markets. That, that anti-truly free markets is not limited to leftist intellectuals. You know, we we like get mad at the Republican Party for saying, oh, we, you know, we support markets. But it's like, no, you don't. Like at every opportunity, you want to make interventions to stack the deck in favor of different groups. Or just um, prohibiting drugs is anti-market but, but that everyone uh, – people tend to dislike all sorts of aspects of markets when those markets don't line up, when the results of those markets don't line up with what they want. And so what, what my, my question is, is the – is what Nozick's explaining here not something unique to intellectuals but is instead simply that 
we want a system – we think that an economic system ought to align with our tastes and our values because we think our tastes and our values are correct. Otherwise, we wouldn't hold them. Um, and so we reject markets whenever they don't align with our values. Um, and think that some other system would be better. We support markets when they seem to align with our values. And by we, I mean people who are not genuinely in favor of free markets. And that might explain a bit of the, the economist being more in favor of free markets because the economist has studied – has more of a big picture view. They see the overall positive effects of markets whereas if you don't have that big picture view, all you really have is your own life and those people around you. And so you're like, wow, the market has rewarded something that's awesome. Therefore, good markets are good. Wow, the market's not rewarding something that's awesome or it's undermining something that's awesome. Therefore, market's bad. And so is this, is this theory – is Nozick's theory basically too limited? Is the problem that markets look random and so they – randomness is ultimately going to conflict with everyone's values at some point? Well, I think that's a Schumpeterian element which is re related. Can you explain I, what you mean by uh, yeah, Schumpeterian? Well, yeah. The, um, the idea that – and Schumpeter was very interested in whether or not a, a free market society would be perceived as just by those who were in it. Uh, and whether or not because of the randomness of the order, uh, an individual person could look at the world and be like, oh, yeah, that, that guy is probably making the money he should be making as a hedge fund manager, something that they don't have any idea about and whether or not a, a, a fully instantiated market society would be fundamentally unstable because everyone – would start looking at it with a kind of skepticism or maybe everyone already does on, on Aaron's point that it's not just limited to intellectuals. Maybe intellectuals have done it because they, they write and speak more often. So maybe we just have like a sampling bias and they systematize it more often and use words like neoliberal and things like <laughs> this. Uh, and so maybe they're just, just out there more. I, I, I suspect that there's still a much higher percentage of certain things in intellectuals than, uh, than there would be in a random sampling of, of other people, I would say. Uh, the question that I was talking about, which I maybe goes back to uh, intellectuals themselves, and this is something that again could be either type one explanation we were saying or type two, but there's something that's pretty common amongst the, the conservatives is that the intellectuals really believe in expertise, and so they believe that society should be run according to expertise. Well, this gets to so Nozick after after setting up why intellectuals might be frustrated with capitalism, we have to move into the question. The next part of the essay is, OK, but why socialism, right? Because there's no on its face reason why a – like just because capitalism doesn't reward intellectual virtues, like we'll stipulate that because I think the intellectuals are largely wrong about that. But let's say they're right. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean therefore socialism will. We need to have an argument for why. And so what Nozick is saying and this gets to the expertise is if we look at the characteristics of the classroom, what you have is a, an author, a single – usually a single authority figure who stands at the front of the classroom and hands out rewards based on what to the intellectual looks like merit. Um, and so what you have is a miniature planned Economy. There's stuff comes in. We've got school supplies. We've got prestige. Gold we've got all stars. that. But that's yeah. not necessarily left or right wing. I mean, Nozick actually does mention some intellectuals who were were uh, right wing. Uh, Yates, Eliot, Pound. He says, and I could easily add many more. You you could talk about Carl Schmitt or Martin Heidegger. It does not necessarily have to skew left wing. It could skew right wing authoritarian. So so yes, why socialism? Well, I think that I mean one way. I can think to answer that question about why socialism because why aren't they – why aren't there as many right-wing intellectuals supporting authoritarianism is if we contextualize it, if we say like let's just look at say the United States or let's look at the, the Western world um, that there's this central planning angle that they seem – that they, they like in Nozick's story because the teacher is the central planner and distributor of fairness. Um, but at the same time, there's an element of what really matters is intellectual discourse which has an element of freedom 
right? Like we want we want a society where people can engage in this freely and openly and we aren't restricted. And so that would seem to cut against authoritarianism. And the mistake obviously that – I mean we would argue this is a mistake is that they see socialism as central planning plus freedom in a way that strict authoritarianism would be central planning plus no freedom. Well, it's central planning for stuff, they would say, and stuff is not really important. Right. What's important is ideas. Right. Ideas are what matter and and we will have free ideas under socialism uh, while technocratically managing stuff. Now, this is a false picture of socialism. This is not accurate at all. In fact, command economies have to have censorship. They can't get by without it. And when you control stuff, you also control people. You control individual lives. It, it, it can't be escaped. There's no getting around that. But the question that I'm asking is, um, so you you have intellectuals. Uh, if we take it as a general category, you one way to get ahead as an intellectual is to tell people that things are not as you perceive them to be. Uh, the, that something counterintuitive is actually true, and then it becomes that, that's a basic, very abstract thing intellectuals would do. Well, that makes it very relational. Uh, but if you if you're an intellectual in society where Let's imagine, and this is a big if for the reasons you just said, but the Soviet Union where intellectuals were free, uh, and that's a big if. But if, <laughs> if you had a Soviet Union where the university was a thriving system and you had an intellectual class that could say anything, oh, they, they tried to that say. for a while and yeah. they had to crush it. I yeah. mean, they couldn't. <laughs> but yeah, they would, couldn't would do that. They, they tried that in China. Yeah. <laughs> but would intellectual intellectuals in the Soviet Union in that, in that hypothetical situation be capitalist? Because they, because they're, the way to push back on the on they produce the counterintuitive idea is to say is to say hey guess maybe the socialist system doesn't work. Well, when they tried that in China, that is exactly what happened. They got ideological deviationism all over the place, and uh, uh, not necessarily that they all became you know little miniature uh, Mises or whatever, but you know, they they had some they had some odd ideas out there and uh, and ones that the regime couldn't put up with, and so yes, they. Uh, you know, the, the, there was a, a period in China that you – know, the hundred flowers period uh, and they had to crush it. They had no no way of dealing with that kind of dissent. Trevor Yeah, the idea here is essentially that uh, the intellectual is as contextual as rage against the machine it, and the machine is as abstract of concept. Rage against the machine – in is anti-capitalist and socialist, but if they were allowed to be, and that's again, that's maybe the best, most important point. But if they were allowed to be in the in the Soviet Union, the machine would be the socialist because the, just like ju intellectual uh, juvenile delinquency is contingent upon what the established standard is, perhaps intellectual and maybe call it intellectual delinquency is also contingent upon what the standard is. So it's uh, they're always going to just basically resist what they perceive to be the the predominant functioning social order. And could that – I mean we're – we may be drifting a bit into the psychologizing that we said we were going to try to avoid yeah, but um, that part of – so you've, you've gone through this school system where you've been praised and you've been told that you're super smart um, and that you, you know, are – you know what you're talking about and then the problem is that when you get out into the world, people aren't listening to you. They're not, you know, that the, the world is organized. The people are doing things that you don't think they should be doing. They have tastes that they're listening to that rock and roll instead of the opera, um, and and so what you want is you want a system where people listen to you, and so which is necessarily going to be somewhat different than the system you've got, which would explain why. And again, it's you know we would say that the Chinese intellectuals who are objecting to communism in favor of capitalism are in fact correct. Um, but if we set aside the notion of the, the truth value of their views, it, there's, there is some level of rebellion in the you know you need to listen to me and so by listening to me, you should be doing something different from whatever it is you happen to be doing. Now, I think Nozick would say though that open and closed societies are asymmetric that way because in a closed society, everybody does know their place. And that's actually one thing that is relatively comfortable about the academy. There's a progression of your academic career. You know how it's supposed to go. It's incredibly structured. It's incredibly closed in that way. Uh, and in an open society, nobody really does know their place. You could be you could be very wealthy tomorrow. You could go broke. Depending on choices that you make, uh, there would be more mobility and uh, mobility not just in money but in prestige, in location, 
in uh, tastes and values. Those things, uh, those things change in an open society and when you're not acculturated to that, it's, uh, it does tend to seem weird. I, I thought a lot of uh, – Thought a lot of Karl Popper in his his talking about how open societies are are uh, unstable as regards individual positions, and uh, and that necessarily seems threatening to somebody who has uh, lived their life in a system that is much more orderly, that is much more uh, uh, you know. There's a there's a course that you follow. You I'm, know, in, I'm in reminded the of I had I mean I've had several I had several professors say something along these lines, but but one in particular who. She would. We've talked about the you know the the move from status to contract, um, and her, oh, I, remember, I remember this. Isn't her, it? I mean, this she, is this is Henry Sumner Maine. Yeah, yeah, but but so the notion that at one time people's position was defined by their the status that they were born into. You were born into the nobility, and you had that level of status, or you were born into serfdom. You had that level of status, and then your role in society was very clearly defined. You knew what it was, and you knew what responsibilities. You had to other people what responsibilities other people had to you um, and that as we shifted to a society based on contract, a society where you could move around, it upset this very strict status-based society which is what you're describing the academy as is basically a society a status of status. Society, exactly. I mean your status can change over time as you age into the different levels of you know, being a professor and getting tenure and all of that but it's a, it looks like a status-based society and I – had a professor in law school who her – much of her intellectual career was based on arguing that we would be better off returning to a society of status where people knew what they owed to each other, that it was a good thing that we had – and I'm, I'm being perhaps May a bit I ask, unfair. Was she a liberal or a conservative? She was, she was very far left. Really? Um, but, because but the argument was that <laughs> it was better because there were going to be people, there were going to be poorer people and that – in and this is a, a mischaracterization of the Middle Ages to say the least, that the kings knew that they owed things to the serfs and that they had to give things to the serfs and it wasn't just like, well, if the serfs can afford it, I'll give it to them and if they can't, they can't. I won't. It's, it was – An you know, obligation. It was an obligation baked into the nature of society. This is why it was sad. Right. Yes. I mean, and that that was so, that's, real so that makes thing. me think like you're talking about is it is it possible then that you know the – if, if what we want is that structured society, socialism is a version of that but a return to – I mean this is the, the neo-reactionaries that we've run into on Twitter, um, a return to a society of status. Well, Ezra Pound exactly made this point in a lot of, a lot of his poetry that now we are without – uh, clear markers of status. We we don't know where to make a home. We don't know where to to, uh, to how to build uh, straight angles any longer. We uh, we are uh, beset by uh, he called it usura, the the goddess of usury, and uh, and that upsets everything. That upsets the the society of status, and and nobody knows their place anymore. I'm struck as you talk about this of how common this notion of wanting to return to a society where you knew – I mean you knew your place I guess seems to be because it shows up in – so there's the, there's the conservatives. Um, there's conservative – the Catholic philosopher Alistair McIntyre talks about this a lot of this need – the communitarians of this notion that you should you know, be deeply embedded in society and know your position in that society, that that's formative of who you are. But I recall reading like an argument for – the question was why do nerds wear fedoras, um, which is an interesting like <laughs> why, why is it that I'm these, these nerdy guys wear I – mean, Trevor has worn fedoras but he claims it was it was either he started the trend or it was he it was, was ironic. Before. Um, but but the, <laughs> the argument which I mean is at least has – is interesting in light of what you said is that if you are a low status male um, in, in the sense that like you're not – Girls aren't flocking to you, right? You're not you're the not, quarterback. You're not the quarterback. You're not. You're. You know. You're the. You're the nerdy computer guy. Um, before you, and you haven't. You haven't gotten to the age where you can found a startup and become the high status person. Then, to some extent, like you long for a time when men were men and women were women, and you knew what the roles were, and that for. The fedora wearing set. The fedora represents this. I mean, it's the ideolog um, idealized status. Los Angeles of the uh. 1940s. You know, when there were tough guys and dames, 
and the tough guys got the girl and there was this – and similarly, there was this level of like chivalry that we see with you know Philip Marlowe. But it's also the, the popularity of medieval England among this low status or perceived by them to be low status set of – again, when there were knights and damsels and society was structured and you knew your place and you didn't have to compete for status and it was very clear and very defined. You know, I, I don't – I don't say I agree with that. I can't uh, because I was that nerdy guy and I just wanted to burn the whole rotten system down. I mean I, I didn't want to take a place in it. I, I wanted to escape it. I think the longing for predictability though is an interesting point um, and whether or not it's better to have – I think it's an existential – the unpredictability of a market – and the ability for to destroy things, including things that you love, whether it's Ma and Pa down the street who's going to go out of business because Walmart came in and all this stuff. It seems chaotic and it doesn't preserve the things you love, uh, uh, not all the time, depending on what you love. And so, yes, the, the desire for predictability, if you want predictability and, and stability, you really shouldn't be for market economies more or less, uh, I think would be – Right. And so again, this plays out. So the, the intellectuals who had the stability of school and then in the academy, the, the very clear stability including, I mean, tenure. Um, but then you see this in the longing for the good old days, for the 1950s as an ideal among social conservatives and you listed it like the lyrics of country music which are about you know things – should stay the same and we should stay close to home and we should do things the way that we've always done them. Um, it it seems to be this real need among people to have things always be the way they've always been and always be predictable. Um, yes. Now I'm going to change the topic slightly to one of the last question is my last question I was pondering, uh, which goes back to the expertise point. And uh, this may cut against my point about the relational or conditional attitudes of intellectuals compared to the Soviet Union here. But – and this may also push back against Nozick's desire to not – and my desire not to pathologize them, which which we've been getting close to anyway. But the question of if, if you consider yourself incredibly smart, which let's just say intellectuals – let's just say almost tautologically do. Uh, then and that is comparatively smarter than most other people. Uh, how wouldn't that contribute to you thinking that most people can't be trusted to do a lot of things on their own? I mean, just a very simple, a very simple extra, extrapolation. If you don't believe in people, it's very hard to be for free markets. It might correlate. I mean, I, I could see that, but uh, it could. It, I mean, I could see it cutting in the other direction as well. Uh, you could say. I have a PhD in economics and I still can't figure out how toothpaste manages to wind up in the bathrooms of every single person in this country and that's astounding. And the people who make toothpaste are not geniuses. They are somehow probably pretty close to average. They're certainly not as smart as I am with my econ PhD and yet it happens. How does that happen? That that you know, it could cut the other direction. It could, it could you know, you could say, in fact, that uh, society, considered as a, a collective, for a moment, uh, is actually smart in ways that I can't be. I could see that, but uh, I could also see the attitude coming into place where you know, when I've talked to people, intellectuals, about something like school choice, uh, and you say, well, parents go out and make choices for their kids uh, about. You know what kind of school they want for them. This isn't a crazy idea, and and the response is often. I mean, do you really think that most parents are equipped to know what's be best for their kids? Like in so many situations, uh, is that really something you want to leave to parents? Like most parents are idiots, and if most parents are idiots, then we don't want them out there choosing. And so again, your perception of other people's relative intelligence, I think, goes a lot to whether or not you believe in. Yeah, in but I think if. I think if people are on average uh, incompetent to run their own lives, then probably a narrow elite at the top is not going to be able to help them. Uh, I We're mean, doomed that, but anyway. that's that's a doctrinal position we have. I mean, <laughs> the, with the intellectuals, they think, well, I mean, what else, what either they're going to have stupid people making choices or going to have smart people making choices. And, Which and one's better? I think we can to bring that back to Nozick's theory. Um, I mean, that so in the classroom, 
it's not just that the classroom is run by an authority figure. It's that the classroom is run by the teacher, right? And the teacher is the person who knows a lot more than everyone else. I mean occasionally you have the experience of realizing that your teacher doesn't or you get a really dumb teacher and you're you're cognizant of it. But most of the time the teacher does in fact know more than you do and the teacher seems to run the classroom relatively well. And so you – I mean in, in Nozick's story, it would stand to reason then that you would come to think that having a smart person, someone who knows more than everyone else, run things is the most effective, the most fair way to go about it. Yeah, I, I, that's. I mean, I think all these things become constellation of factors, and uh, we haven't mentioned the long march again. All all these things together between uh, Nozick's points are are somewhat. I think they're good, but there needs to be more. The long march is is good, need more. I think the relational aspects, um, and then of course you just sort of have like a tipping point type of thing. I mean, if for some reason the intellectual class, uh, the people who hire and fire at universities and the people who hire and fire in newspapers, uh, just for some random reason, whether it was the baby boom of the 60s and the leftism of the 60s and so all of a sudden they just get swayed to one side, well, then your career prospects and other things like this start determining whether or not you're going to advance in – you have to have the right beliefs to advance in the sociology department or it's going to be very difficult or the journalism department. So then you just have a critical mass that becomes a self-perpetuating thing because you have to be – and that's, that was a comment often made about think tanks is that it was it were you know, people who wanted to be professors but were conservative or libertarian who fled the universities because they couldn't really say what they wanted to say and expect to get good job prospects. And so that's why conservatives and libertarians were the first movers on the think tank uh, front. And so you have all this mix mashed together and I think you start to get a general picture of why this class is. I think future episodes we'd have to deal with like Hollywood and public school teachers and other classes of <laughs> predominantly anti-capitalist people. Then to close out this discussion, if Nozick is correct, if this story that he tells either explains all of intellectual anti-capitalism or at least a decent chunk of it, if the, the environment of the schools plays a large role, what can we do about that? What are our prospects for shifting things in a more free market direction? Uh, I'm not terribly optimistic about that but I don't think it, it means that we're doomed to lose. I think that the universities are very large and at this point – path-dependent institutions to a large degree unless we can uh, start building up other intellectual classes and other ideas. And and, and that stuff I'm, I'm optimistic about. The, the interesting story of Baldy Harper, F.A. Harper, who started IHS, the Institute for Humane Studies, which is an, a quite old uh, free market – 1961 and it's pretty old by these standards, who wasn't allowed to teach uh, Hayek in his economics class at Cornell. So he said um, – well, screw this. Uh, I'm going to go start a nonprofit that teaches Hayek to students anyway. Um, so I'm optimistic about uh, things like that. But I think that the institution, the universities and the other institutions are are pretty set in their ways. And a lot of what Nozick said are some of the reasons and some of the things we've discussed today are other reasons and I don't see it changing much. What do you think, Jason? I would say that if Nozick is right, we ought to consider the currency that academics accept, which is respect and, and perhaps consider giving them less of it. Uh, the idea that one absolutely must go to a four-year college in order to uh, get a, a good job afterward is one that people have been criticizing lately. And, and while I still find great value in the academy and I think that, uh, that at times it's, it's possible to overplay that criticism, I would also say that things like that should put them on notice. And uh, alternate institutions, the rise of things like think tanks and, and of, uh, of uh, alternate uh, educational opportunities ought to, uh, ought to make them wonder, you know, is this, uh, is this something that uh, is going to eat into our prestige? Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. 
To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. And I should note, if you haven't already, you should check out our new Cato Audio app, available in the Apple App Store for iPad and iPhone. It's a super easy and free way to listen to not just free thoughts, but the other podcasts from libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute.